everybody welcome back to my channel and if you're new welcome my name is Zoe but most people know me on here on Instagram as ZA Reptiles and today we're doing my absolute most requested video of all time everyone has been requesting this video for literal years and I kept putting it off and saying not yet not yet not yet it's finally here the day has finally come we're doing a jeweled Lacerda care guide now we might be like what, a minute into this video. I don't want to go any further without saying I am not an expert. I do not claim to be an expert. This is just what I have found in my research, what has worked for me. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Always do tons of research before getting an animal. Use different sources. Use books. YouTube. YouTube is totally fine. People are totally against or seem to be against care guides on YouTube. I don't know why I think it's another great source of information whether or not you go with that information is up to you and what you find in your research so never use one source as your only source use lots of places to find research so you can form your own ideas on how to care for an animal now with that being said the reason this video has taken so long to come out is because I have a couple personal standards I guess we'll call them when it comes to making care guides I have to own an animal for at least one year before I even think of making a care guide. And then I have to feel very confident in their care. And now a new standard I added is I want them to be in an enclosure, in a setup that I am very proud of that I really want to show off. So that's the main reason Crikey hasn't gotten a care guide yet is because I knew that I was going to be building him a bigger enclosure and so I was waiting for that to be done that I could show that in this video. With that being said, there are some past care guides I have done that I will probably eventually redo because the longer I spend in the hobby, the more my ideas of husbandry change and evolve. So now I look at some care guides I did in the past and I'm like, you know, I probably wouldn't even mention that now looking back. Like there's, there's things that I don't do anymore, things that I prefer not to do anymore that I probably wouldn't even mention in a care guide or I'd briefly mention it and say but I would prefer not to like heat maps. Okay so I will not be handling Crikey for this video so I did wear my Crikey shirt merch link in bio so if you want to get yourself a Crikey shirt this is a crop top I love it but I figured since he wouldn't be handling him in the video I would just wear his face on me. Now we'll get to that when it gets to handling. Crikey and I have a love-hate relationship. I love him. He loves when I bring him food. Doesn't like to be touched, doesn't like to be handled. When I handle him, I have to... Here it is. When I handle him, I have to wear gloves. He's got very, very sharp nails and my hands get torn apart. So now I will not handle him. If I don't have gloves, I can only find one glove. So either I'm picking which hand I like the most and sacrificing the other one or I just don't handle him for the video so I'm just not gonna handle him today instead I'm gonna put in pictures and videos over the top of this video so you still get to see him it just will be in his happy setting and not me holding a very angry lizard and him pooping on me I do also want to add that I did not last year but the year before because you guys were wanting a care guide so badly I didn't feel comfortable doing one I did do a pros and cons video for jeweled lacertos where I give you a list of pros and a list of cons and I know some people were upset that the cons list was much longer than the pros list but I think it's very important when you're looking at getting an animal to understand all of the cons to owning that animal because that's going to be the tough part is the cons so understanding that before you get an animal allows you to really commit to the animal because you already know what to expect Pros are great, but cons I think are the most important thing to understand. So I will leave that video linked below. I did hold Crikey in that video, so you can see how angry he is. But I'll link that below if you want to check that video out after this one. So I like to start off every care guide giving some background information on the species. I think it's very important to understand where the species comes from, its range and habitat and whatnot before jumping into the care. It's going to have an understanding of the individual. So the jeweled lacerda is also known as the oscillated lizard. You might see oscillated lizards sometimes. And they are a diurnal lizard, meaning they're awake during the day and they sleep at night from Europe. So Portugal, Spain, parts of France and Italy. And they've got a variety of habitats. You're talking shrubby areas, woodlands, rocky areas, 
vineyards, meadows, olive groves. So kind of a variety of habitats, basically what you would find over in Europe. So not super tropical. You'll see in a little bit, my said it looks a little tropical. They're not really tropical, but with their colors, I like the setup I have because I feel like it just really brings out the colors. But as far as temperatures and humidity and everything goes, his stuff is spot on. It's just the setup looks a little more tropical than what you would typically find them in, in the wild. So they are a medium sized lizard, often being called a mini tegu. Personally, I think that's a little bit of false advertising because tegus are, can be pretty docile and sweet and whatnot. And I haven't seen too many lizardas that actually are okay with handling. Those that have lizardas that they can handle and hang out with, jealous. I am jealous. I am jealous. I worked with Crikey. We were finally making progress. And then um, I had a little bit of a mite issue last year and had to handle him a lot for mite treatments. And I became seen as evil. So that all went out the door. And now we're just working up to me just touching him for good handling. We're working on me just touching him again. So it's quite the process. So this is not a lizard you go into fully expecting to handle it and hang out with it. When you get a lizard like that, awesome. Not totally common with this species. So males versus females is another thing I like to talk about. Males typically bigger, they have a much bigger head, they've got jowls, which kind of does make them like a mini tegu, they have those jowls. And males do tend to be brighter in color. So. You'll see when I show you Craigie, if I haven't already put videos in over the top of this, he is very bright and very colorful. I absolutely love him. One of my favorite species that I keep, even though I don't handle him and he doesn't really love me the way I love him, I think I will never not own a jeweled deserta. I absolutely love, they're just so fun to interact with and watch, even if you don't handle them. He's so much fun to just watch. So I will always own a jeweled lizard, even if I don't get to handle it really, and they don't really love me the way I love them. I will just, ah, I love jeweled lizardas. Okay, so we briefly started talking about their temperament and handling. So I really want to just focus in on that for a minute. So they are a very skittish lizard, don't really love handling. Like I said, this is an animal you get expecting it to hang out with you and handling it like you would a tegu, a ball python, a bearded dragon. You have to go in with the mindset that this animal might not ever really like you. <laughs> now the good news is, like I said, there are some people that have ones that they can handle. They can be tamed down. They are very food motivated. So that is a pro of these guys. They're very, very food motivated. So usually what I do is I'll touch Crikey, give him a piece of food if he did really well. I'll do it again, give you food. Sometimes I'll have him walk onto my hand to get food. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. He's a very smart lizard. Um, but I have a couple times gotten him to walk on my hand to get his food if I'm tongue feeding. So they are very food motivated and can be tamed down. Using food would be your best bet. <laughs> now they are capable of dropping their tail. I've never seen a lizarda that has dropped its tail. I've never heard of a lizarda dropping their tail, but they are capable of doing it. Like I also mentioned earlier, they do have very sharp nails as well. So if you have a feisty one that isn't going to want you to handle it, use caution because they will shred your hands. And it is very painful because they're very tiny and sharp. They're not like big and sharp like iguana nails. They are like tiny, tiny and sharp. So they rip right through your skin. So I do recommend having gloves on hand because even though I don't handle him readily, there are days that I do have to handle him. So if I'm like when I was moving can't move if I don't put them in a travel container. So have these on hand just in case you ever need to handle. You've got gloves so your hands don't get absolutely shredded. Okay, so let's talk about their size. Like I said, males are bigger than females. Males can reach up to about two feet in length, including their tail. They do have very long tails. So as far as their body goes, you're not talking a two foot long body. But with their long tail, they can reach up to two feet in length typically. Females will usually be around 16 to 24 inches so usually around like a foot and a half is what we're talking with the tail so definitely smaller than males although males you're not guaranteed that max size so just because males can reach 24 inches doesn't mean that it's going to but just keep in mind males are going to be much bigger than females typically 
lifespan, just like most reptiles I'm finding, you're talking teens to 20s. I don't know that I've ever seen one that's much older, like in its later 20s. Usually I see teens to 20s. So they're going to be around a while. You know, any reptile is going to be a commitment. They've got pretty long lives given proper care. Go having. So before I got Crikey, I almost actually got a trio. But I didn't want a trio. I only wanted one. So I passed up on it. Um, but the Reptile Expo where I got Crikey, literally like the day before, I saw someone post in the Facebook page for that expo they were trying to rehome their trio of Jewel Desertas. Um, for actually the same price that I got Crikey for, so I really should have gotten the trio. But, <laughs> cohabbing. I would say leave cohabbing this species to breeders and experts because mating with these guys can be quite brutal. So I would leave, and you don't want to cohab two males, just like pretty much any species. You don't want to cohab two males because territorial, aggressive, yada yada, you, whole nine yards. So as far as like multiple males or multiple females and males and whatnot, I would just leave that to the breeders who know what they're doing because it can be a pretty aggressive display. So I'd recommend just getting one individual and they'll be totally fine. They don't need a friend. This is Crikey's enclosure right here, right next to my bed, and he's totally content living by himself. And then because I'm me, I like to work in a conservation message whenever I can. So in their native habitat, these guys actually are near threatened. So not threatened, not endangered, but near threatened. So they are on a downslide a little bit. And this is for a couple of reasons. Habitat loss is typically the main thing that we see when it comes to animals moving their way towards becoming threatened or endangered. It's typically habitat, I feel, or it's typically habitat loss, I feel like. It's super common and it's very unfortunate. Um, pesticide pollution, there's more predators eating the things they eat, so there's a decline in their natural prey. And thankfully these guys are actually protected in Spain, so capture and trade is actually not allowed in Spain. They are protected species, which is super awesome. Okay, so now that we've covered the basics of the species, where they come from, males versus female size, lifespan, etc., we're going to get into the care part. So the part that you guys have all been waiting for and wanting, the care. Now first, so this is divided into sections. We're going to start off with the enclosure because you got a lizard, you need somewhere to put it. So enclosure. Now this is where I'm glad that I actually took a couple years to make this video and let myself kind of evolve as a keeper because my mindset here has changed. So when you're googling care guides, now there's not a lot of information out there for Jewel Deserter Care, which is why this is a very requested video. Um, even myself, you know, I struggle and there's a lot more information now that it's been a couple years, but I found whatever I could and then found breeders, found people that owned them and talked to them and just kind of combined all of the information I got to kind of figure out what I was doing. And then I wanted to spend a couple of years, especially with this species, kind of honing in what I was doing for his care and getting it to a point where I felt comfortable talking about it with other people. So, and this is why it takes me a while to put out care guides and why I give myself at least a year of keeping an animal before I try to teach others about it. So for Crikey, it's been three years, maybe almost three years of owning him and working on his care to really hone it in and get it to a point where I can talk about it. So when you Google information, what you typically find sometimes some places is that a 40 gallon breeder is the minimum. Now if you've been around a while, you know that I had Crikey in a 40 gallon breeder before I built his enclosure. I don't think it was horrible. But, having put him in this enclosure now, I would not recommend a 40 gallon breeder as the minimum. I think it's fine to use it as they're growing. Now I did upgrade Crikey as he grew, just because I had lots of empty tanks on hand, so I had the ability to do that. But, I would recommend jumping right in off the bat with a 40 gallon breeder if you're getting a baby or even a juvenile. I think that is okay. Um, I got a lot of negative feedback on one of the first videos I did of Crikey because I had him in a 20 gallon tank because um, he was a baby. He was very tiny and in my opinion at the time that 20 gallon was fine. 
looking back now, I think I would rather put him in a 40 gallon breeder right off the bat, but it, it didn't not work. So he was on a 40 gallon and then he became a juvenile and I moved him to a 30 gallon and then I moved him to a 40 gallon as an adult until I could get this built. If I could do it all over again, I would have gone right for the 40 gallon and skipped all the others because I think that was an ideal size for him until adulthood. So ultimately, I would not recommend a 40 gallon breeder for an adult. What I would recommend as the absolute minimum is a four by two by two, which is what Crikey has over here. So this is four foot long, two foot deep, and two foot tall. Seeing him in it, if I could redo it, I would probably do a five by two by two or a five by three by two. So five foot long, three foot deep, two foot tall. Now this isn't bad. He fits in here very well, but he does utilize the whole space. So I think it would be nice if he had a little more floor space. So a lot of places you'll see now they do say 4 by 2 by 2 is a good size for them. I would say for a female, that's probably really good. For a male, I might add an extra foot on there um, in both directions. So again, this is totally fine. I think this is okay as a minimum. But seeing how he uses the space, I wish that I had gone a little bigger but it's not bad so getting this species that's what you should aim for know that you're either going to, have to buy and pay money to have someone build you an enclosure or you're going to, have to build your own so that you can achieve the size that they're going to need so again four by two by two minimum but bigger is always better so i'm not going to give you a maximum because in my opinion there never is a maximum enclosure size only a minimum because you can never go too big so four by two by two minimum. The bigger is always better. Also very important, front opening. So very hard to do if you have a 40 gallon breeder unless you're going for like a 40 gallon exoterra which opens in the front which I would recommend. Because these guys, you wanna to try to earn their trust and they're very skittish and very food motivated. You wanna be able to come at them from the front as opposed to the top which is where a predator like a bird would come in. So you're just much less threatening and it's easier to access them if you're coming in from the front as opposed to having to come in from the top. So 100% front opening would recommend. Okay, moving on to substrate because now you've got the lizard, the enclosure, what's going in it. Substrate, also I say that don't get an animal until you're ready for it would be my biggest recommendation. Have the stuff you need so when you get the animal, you're good to go. Okay, so moving on, substrate. They love to dig and burrow, so you're going to need a deep substrate that allows for that. Now, when they're babies, I think paper towel is totally fine. They are very aggressive eaters. They're very fun to watch when you're feeding them. But starting out, paper towels, I think, is totally fine for babies. Once they're no longer babies, you move into loose substrate. So the number one thing I use for all my animals is a mix of organic topsoil. So I personally use Scott's Organic Topsoil that I can get right at Home Depot. And I mix it with play sand, which I can also get at Home Depot. So whatever I mix for topsoil and place sand, the ratio just depends on the species and the humidity that I'm trying to achieve. So you just have to find your happy medium with that. And then to go with topsoil and place sand, I like to mix in something a little more chunky. So usually rupta bark, rupta chip, or forest floor. I'll mix in just to give it even more texture and whatnot. And this is an attempt at a bioactive setup, so I do have live plants and cleanup crew. So the more surface area and textures you have, the better if you don't have a drainage layer, which I do not because they love to dig. Now I'm not saying you have to go bioactive. Some people it's just easier to not even attempt to bother with bioactive. Um, but I'd still recommend just mixing as much as you can together. It just makes it, in my opinion, a little more natural, a little more fun. Um, gives it more texture and more substance. And so, yeah. So topsoil, play sand, and then whatever else you want to mix in. Now I also mix in moss to try to help with humidity. We'll talk about humidity in a little bit. Um, but aim for more of like a humid hide area so moss that's all in one area to hold humidity so just like you would do with most reptiles provide a humid area so that if they're shedding or whatnot they can control the gradient of humidity that they are receiving and then finally 
if you're going bioactive or maybe you just want to use it because it looks natural um, leaf litter I do use some leaf litter on top for my cleanup crew I also just really like the way that leaf litter looks because it looks very natural okay so humidity I've seen lots of different things for this um, aim for like moderate humidity again looking at the habitats they come from they're not super humid habitats they're also not super dry it's like moderate so like 50 to 60 percent humidity is what I usually aim for I usually aim for a little bit higher I aim for about 50 to 70 so you're talking like 50 to 60 to 70 right in the middle range moderate humidity just gauge your animal see what they do best with their shedding raise the humidity a little bit you just don't want to go super nuts again they're not a rainforest animal but they're also not like a super desert animal right in the middle there so what I do to maintain humidity so I tend to spray in the morning or every other day um, I don't spray at the end of the day when lights go off because then it really cools it down I usually tend to spray in the morning so then the plants get some water too so how much you spray is just going to depend on your setup and where you are I'm in northern New York so it's very dry here so I do spray a lot more than I would if I was somewhere that's a little more humid like we had already mentioned you can provide a humid hide that gives a good area that's increased moisture and then of course providing a water dish gives them access to water you want to give them fresh water anyway but it can also help with humidity also we talked about providing a deep substrate so they can dig that deep substrate will also provide a humidity gradient especially if you're putting in water so like I do because it's a bioactive setup and I have plants I'll occasionally dump in water and that will just create a gradient because the water will sink down and the top layer of soil will dry up first so it's drier on top and the deeper you go down there's more moisture and it's more humid so if they're digging there's a bit of a humidity gradient there as well okay before we go on to moving our way up the enclosure to lights and whatnot I want to talk about the enrichment and decor so very important these guys are very curious lizards very active love to climb and explore like I said earlier in the video they're just super fun to watch I love watching Crikey I don't mind that he doesn't let me handle him because I have so much fun just sitting on my bed and watching him so you want to give plenty of places to climb to hide it's always important to give plenty of hiding opportunities but climbing places exploring um, again places where they come from naturally in the wild they would come from some rocky areas so you can definitely put in rocks just make sure that the rocks are touching the bottom of the enclosure and not just sitting on top of the soil because should they try to bury underneath smush so I'd place your rocks rocks first so they're touching the bottom and then put in your substrate I personally love to use lots of cork bark and sticks um, he's got a cork tube that he actually loves he sleeps in it every night it's super cute so yes the more you can give these lizards to do the better okay so moving on to lighting and as far as heat goes this is probably the most conflicting area of their care that I have seen throughout the years of doing research and talking to people and whatnot there's a lot of different opinions on what their heat should be so I've seen people say the warm side should be 85 to 90 I've seen 90 to 95 I've seen 95 to 100 I've seen 100 to 110 so really I guess you have to mess around with it and see what your lizard responds best to so I usually aim for like 100 to 105 preferably um, he does pretty well with it in the hundreds sometimes 110 it's okay I don't go above 110 though I try to stick for around like 105 that seems to be what Crikey responds to very well and that's for his basking area so not necessarily the ambient temperature of the warm side but the specific spot he's basking on that surface area is what I'm aiming for to be around 105 degrees other than that the warm side 90s or whatnot and then cool end I usually aim for about low 80s but you can go high 70s to low 80s to the cool side for the bigger the gradient the better because then they have a lot of options as far as controlling their own body temperature they can move wherever they need to go um, at nighttime you just don't want it to drop below 70 degrees so personally I don't use nighttime heat in my room my room sits at about 72 to 74 at nighttime so none of my animals have nighttime heat with the exception of a couple of snakes and whatnot that still have heat pads so they haven't switched over to overhead heating yet but other than that none of my animals have nighttime heat because it doesn't drop below 70 ever in my room at night and as far as what to use for heating you can get a typical reptile basking bulb 
but typically what I use is a halogen floodlight that I can get right at any hardware store because they provide a lot of heat, like actually so much that you need to get a dimmer. So you can get a plug-in dimmer at Home Depot or you can use a reptile lamp if you're doing something with that that has a dimmer switch already on it. But you want to be able to control how much heat is coming out, but you want a very strong bulb because of the amount of heat that we're aiming for with these guys. If you're like me and you're going to go for above 100. I also just find it a little more cost effective to buy halogen floodlights because you can buy them in like packs of two or three at the store for like maybe just a little bit more than your average reptile basking bulb. And because they are floodlights, they cover a really nice area. Okay, UVB, one of the most important parts of reptile keeping. Now, for those of you that have been around, you know already what I'm going to say, Arcadia T5HOs. Now, when I had Cranky in a 40 gallon, I did have a Mega Ray on him. I'm not totally against Mega Rays. I know some people are. Mega Rays, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, are mercury vapor bulbs. So they produce heat and UVB all in one. The problem with this is you can't really control it. You can't put it on a dimmer, and they do produce a lot of heat. I've also heard that they are inconsistent with how much UVB they put off, or they put off too much UVB, and I've been using them with them for years and I haven't had a problem but now I have a solar meter so I can actually test the UVB coming out myself so I'll get back to you guys on that um, as I test as the months go on so that I can form my very good opinion based on research my own research um, on my opinion on Mega Rays but for the purpose of this video because I'm switching all of my animals to Arcadia's I'm gonna say Arcadia I really like the linear UVBs because they cover more area so they don't have to be basking to get that UVB which is one thing that is a downside to the mercury vapor bulbs is they're only getting UVB if they're basking so if they're done basking and they're warmed up they're gonna leave and then they're not getting UVB anymore so if you have a linear tube they can leave that really hot basking area but still get that beneficial UVB now you want the UVB to span about two-thirds of the enclosure that way they can get it when they're basking they can get it when they're not basking and then they can leave the UVB completely and be in an area so they can control the UVB gradient and how much they're getting so what you're going to want is an Arcadia T5HO 12% or 14% depending on your setup so go to the Arcadia lighting guide all you have to do is google Arcadia lighting guide and it'll pull up put in I forget, I don't think it says Jeweled Lacerda, but it might. You might have to put an oscillated lizard, but I think they, it pulls up Jeweled Lacerda. And look at their guide, and it'll tell you based on the distance from your animal to the light what you're going to need, because that will determine whether you need 12% or 14%. Okay, so the final part that we're going to talk about is diet and supplementation. So they are omnivores, however, they're going to eat primarily insects. Now as far as when to feed them, this is going to depend on your lizard. You'll find a lot of things say every single day and for a baby to a juvenile working up to an adult I did feed every single day. I would recommend every single day. But now that Crikey is an adult I feel like every single day he was starting to get a little chunky and he also wasn't finishing his food. So now I feed him every other day. So he gets fed four times a week and this has worked out really really well for us. So I do think that's kind of a thing that I'm starting to see now in the reptile hobby is there's animals they say you have to feed every single day but I don't think you really need to feed every single day um, there's a lot of animals I have that I don't feed every single day and that I feed like every other day or five days a week or six days a week and it seems to be working really really well so for jeweled lacertas I would say every single day until they're an adult then I think you can do every other day but again this is just going to depend on your lizard pay attention to your lizard like I said Crikey was starting to get kind of chunky so we backed him off to every other day and this is working really well for us so like I said this care guide is based on what I do and what works for me what works for me it might not work for somebody else but the whole purpose of my care guide is to share with you guys what I do so like I said insects Dubia roaches, crickets, superworms, pretty much any of the insects you can feed. Definitely pay attention to which ones are better than others. Like dubia roaches are really good, so I definitely recommend breeding dubia roaches, having those on hand. Hornworms, butterworms, waxworms, mealworms, stuff like that are good treats. Um, again, 
They're very food motivated, so you could use treats to your advantage, but those are things I would feed constantly. Crickets, sil silkworms, um, superworms, dubia roaches are things that I would more so feed. There's also quite a few different Rapashi mixes they can have. Yours may eat them, yours may not. Um, so far I've given him a bluey buffet and he licks it but doesn't quite eat it but he likes it so i think he likes the taste of it just doesn't understand that he can full-on eat it so there are apaches that you can give to them um i would just mix it in variety is the most important thing in my opinion when feeding animals we don't want to eat the same thing every day neither do they so you can definitely mix it in work it into their diet schedule um so that they get a little bit of a variety now like i said they are omnivores so you also want to offer greens and fruits they may not eat them. Crikey refuses he'll eat fruits, but he will not touch greens at all. But it's just something that's good to offer because they are omnivores and technically they could and should and it would be beneficial to, for them to eat even though they don't think so. Okay, and then supplementation. Like any reptile, you're going to want calcium and you're going to want multivitamin. So for calcium, you're going to want one without D3 because you are giving them a high, high quality UVB when you're using an Arcadia. Um, you can also use a Zoomed T5, which can be found at your local pet stores very easily. However, I have issues with them. I prefer the Arcadias because you can get more specific with what it is your animal needs. So I prefer Arcadia over Zoomed T5s. I've used Zoomed. I've tested Zoomed with the solar meter. I'm not impressed. So. For this care guide, I'm telling you, Arcadia T5HO is the way to go. Woo! I did not mean for that to rhyme, but go me. That's awesome. Arcadia T5HO is the way to go. That is going to be my motto now. So again, if you've got proper UVB, your animal's getting D3 already, so it does not need to be given extra D3 in its calcium. So you want calcium without D3. So for calcium, I personally have the Earth Pro A from Arcadia. Um, that's the thing I was able to get my hands on. If you're in the States, it can be a little harder to get your hands on Arcadia products because they are out of Canada. But I was able to get myself my hands on some Earth Pro A, um, which when you look at their schedules, they do recommend using almost every day. So, great. Before I switched to Arcadia supplements, I was using Zoomed Repticalcium without D3. Totally fine. You can get that at any pet store. Last topic in my camera, I had to die. Okay, so we're talking about calciums. I don't recommend Repcal products. Zoomed Repticalcium without D3. There's different Arcadia calciums. Rapashi calciums are good. So there's like Supercal no D or Supercal low D. So I do use calcium every feeding with the exception of the day that I do multivitamins. So I do multivitamins every other week. So it turns out to be twice a month. Um, sometimes I usually do like once a month, but now that I've got everything on a schedule, I do rotate calcium and multivitamin on one of the feeding days every other week. So it ends up being twice a week that he does, or twice a month that he does get a multivitamin. So don't recommend Herptivite. Stay away from that one. Um, I was using for the longest time Reptivite. Now I use Supervite from Rapashi. Again, calcium's Zoomed Repticalcium without D3 is what I've used for years until now that I'm trying to switch to Arcadia products. Totally fine. Multivitamins, Reptivite, um, Rapashi Supervite. That's what I've got right here. I have the container. See, so yeah, I do a calcium at every feeding and then a multivitamin every two weeks. So one day, one of those days, instead of a calcium, I do a multivitamin. The next week I'll do calcium that day, the next week I'll do multivitamin that day. So just switches it up and works way in there. So one to two times a month for your multivitamin, every feeding for your calcium. That is what I do. Okay, so that is it for this Jewel Lacerda Care Guide. I hope I didn't miss anything, but yes, after years of waiting, it's finally here. Again, make sure to do all your research. Don't just use this video as a one and done. You can use it to compare information with other sources, but yeah. If you have any further questions or things to add, feel free to hit up the comment section below. And as always, thank you guys for joining me and watching today, and we'll see you for the next video. Bye!